right, what's up guys? What's growing on? I hope you all are happy, healthy, and safe and have been enjoying some of these new relevant videos. Today I'm doing some consulting work, picking up some plants, making some deliveries in Central Florida. And I had a couple of hours to spare, so I figured while I was out here, I brought the film equipment, picking up some more material for my friend Josh. And we are at Hart today, back in Central Florida, the Wake, Lake Wales area. And Hart is basically a education center. They're doing some epic stuff out here. They have a nursery. And Josh, in my opinion, is probably one of the leaders here in the state with growing perennials and food, uh, fruit trees and um, fodder type crops, you name it. He's doing some really epic work out here. And really the type of people I'm trying to feature right now are the ones that are doing epic stuff that have amazing information to share. So I'm not gonna be doing my normal, maybe tour videos per se. This is all very dense information focused type videos here going forward over the next month, you know, during this whole coronavirus pandemic situation. So stay put, I'm gonna have probably five videos coming at you from Heart today, all types of epic information, everything from harvesting to cooking, um, to quick growing crops, to raised beds, you name it. Josh is about to fill your minds with knowledge, so hold tight. All right, what are we doing over here? Uh, plant sweet potato. So I just took these uh, cuttings from over here. This is our uh, nursery little grow out for the slips that are gonna go out and get planted all, all in these beds for the summer. Um, this variety is called Tainong 64, and last year it was the most productive of all the varieties that I trialed, which was like 15. And I got about seven pounds of production per plant, and there's about 40 plants per bed, which is about 250 pounds in a bed. And um, this variety um, seems to not mind the uh, long day length during its growing season, which is what I was mostly after. And it's really vigorous and productive and good. So yeah, I'm planting in here. Last night I, I flipped this bed, so I, I uh, hoed out the old, it was starting to look like this, where there was a lot of weeds and old desiccated crops in there. So I uh, hoed that out and then came in with new mulch and then planting right behind. So here. I plant these kind of horizontally. The mulch comes right back over. Just like that. So we're doing sweet potato, uh, several different, we're, we're in a transition time in the, uh, in the raised beds right now. Um, we're, all the cool season crops are dying from the heat. We had some uncharacteristic heat in uh, March and April. Um, and a lot of this stuff is just done. So all the broccoli and, and kale and lettuce and cabbage and all that kind of stuff is getting fried. So we've harvested out and preserved or sold most of that stuff by now. And now we're in this transition period where we're moving into the more tropical uh, type crops. So a lot of these beds are gonna be in sweet potato because from today's date, which is, I don't know, but <laughs> almost, uh, we're almost here at uh, May 1st. It's about 120 days until our next batch of students shows up. And that's when we're gonna be wanna, wanna be flipping these beds back over into uh, more vegetable crops. So um, this sweet potato fits that niche of taking about that many days to produce. Um, so when our next batch of students comes, this will all get uh, pulled out and harvested and then we'll go right back in with, uh, you know, it could be tomatoes or peppers or cabbage or onions or carrots or whatever. Uh, so the goal here is to use every inch of these beds every day of the year as much as possible. I'm not doing a great job of that right now. You can see some weeds are colonizing here. But um, through crops like sweet potato in the summertime, we're able to move towards that goal of growing something for food in here all year long. Another one we're doing in the beds over the summertime is taro, 
we actually get about the same production on taro as sweet potato, about six or seven pounds per plant, and it's at the same density. So we can get, you know, 250 pounds of taro out of one of these beds as well, which I think is pretty great. The taro takes a little bit longer than the sweet potato, but that doesn't, that doesn't bother me. So when you take these cuttings, there's, there's some debate on if you should leave the leaves or not. Anytime you have leaves on a cutting, they continue to transpire water away from the stem. And a lot of times that can result in actually killing stem tissue of cuttings. Sweet potato is pretty resilient, but um, yesterday I did a round of them and decided to leave the leaves on. And they completely baked and were like laying over like they were dead and I came through and removed the leaves. And they did bounce back. So for, just for context, I wanted to show people the native soil on this property. It's some of the worst soil in the state, I think, and probably some of the worst soil in the world. So this is our roadway, and you can see what the parent soil is. It's, it's uh, a very coarse grain soil. It's, we're on the Lake Wales Ridge. It's this big deposit of, uh, the, a glacier deposited this, this sand, and they're very large particles. So they have very little water holding capacity and also organic matter and nutrients just washes down in between the particles because they're so large. And it's also very acidic. Um, so it's challenging conditions to grow vegetables in. So um, we used to grow and just right in the ground. Um, we did that for years and we were able to do okay. Uh, we did all the practices like cover cropping and using lots of mulch and things like that but we were still really limited in what we could do so we decided to kind of experiment with these raised beds and we built one and our production went up times 10 so we built another and then one day we just decided to just do the rest so there's 23 of these i believe and um i i really took the uh the cuban model um, they have a system they implemented in Cuba in the 90s called Organopanicos and they're these raised beds and they actually use roofing material to make the edging. There's a great new documentary on YouTube about their um, urban agriculture in Cuba. But I, I looked at these Cuban documents and videos and stuff and really modeled this after that. So it's almost like a container garden up on top of that soil. Um, it's a mix. Basically we've supercharged this uh, soil it's a mix of local red clay, which is mostly added for water retention, but it does also have some uh, um, iron and other minerals in it. Um, local sand, which we've just used from here. Actually, the school pushed off an old like swamp land and made a big mound of sand that they let us just take. So that was good because it was rich in organic matter. And then um, compost. And those things are layered back and forth because that's the most efficient way to do it. And we basically built these frames and then dumped the stuff in with five gallon buckets. So it was a tremendous amount of work. We built these over a year. But since doing that, not only are we self-sufficient in produce, we're selling and giving away lots of stuff. We can't keep up with eating, even with 10 or 15 people eating all the vegetables and herbs and fruits and things that come out of these beds. So uh, it's a lot of work and a lot of input, but the payback is really high. So this is just tin roofing ripped in half lengthways. This was old stuff from an old building that was torn down that somebody donated. So there's all kinds of dings and tears in it. And then these are steel poles, which amazingly there were hundreds of random pieces of steel laying around here. So there's bed frames and all sorts of old rusty junk. Um, they're about three and a half feet and they get driven in every four feet down the length of the bed to hold up the tin. And uh, then there's a like a, a ground cloth liner on the bottom to keep the small particles of organic matter and clay from leaving. And uh, then in the bed, yeah, it's those three ingredients. So we've got about $100 poured into each bed, which uh, was expensive to do, but you get that back really, really quick in produce. If you can sell a head of lettuce for $3, I mean, I can fit $100 worth of lettuce in eight feet of this bed. <clears throat> just in three months, you know, you can pay back on this bed. Especially for, for just to build one for a home, you could grow a lot of vegetables for your for your home just on one of these beds or even smaller. How big are they, Josh? They're four by 40. Now, uh, most growers grow on a 30 inch bed. 
but because we're putting in so much infrastructure into the sides and the soil and everything, it made more sense to make them wider. Um, so we can reach to the middle easily for harvesting, weeding. Um, about anybody can reach the middle from either side. And uh, they're about 40 feet long, which is about as long as you want to go without having a, a cut through because it gets annoying to walk long lengths without being able to cut across. And there are 27 inches apart this direction, which is just enough to fit a wheelbarrow through and to be able to, for two people to pass without hitting each other. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the construction. Um, we did have to bring in a lot of soil, um, but overall I think it's a better return because we're gonna be not importing food nearly on a, on a much less scale. Um, another big advantage, there's a lot of advantages to when we transition to this. The big one is the fertility and water holding of the soil just went through the roof. So we could grow crops we couldn't even grow before, like taro. I couldn't grow this in the ground um, very easily because it likes more moist conditions. But now, you know, this we can grow eggplants. I used to not be able to grow because of nematodes. Now, just slam them in here and they, they, they go crazy. Um, the other thing is we used to not be able to do drip irrigation because the particles of sand are so large that um, when water would come out of one of these drip emitters, it would just go straight down and it would have no capillary action to move the water sideways. So now that this soil is more, um, has more wicking ability, when water comes out of this emitter, it moves sideways and all the soil becomes wetted. I'm not wetting this with any hose or anything. This is just from the drip it's able to, to stay uh, this wet. And so by switching to drip, uh, we have way less disease on the crops because when you spray with jet, uh, maxi jets or overhead water, that's when you get outbreaks of disease, especially on solanaceous crops and cucurbits. Uh, so we have way less disease problems. The armadillos and rabbits can't get into the beds because this is too tall for them, which are, we used to have big problems with those two pests. Um, so it's kind of been win, 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 win. And you can see when we added this in, there were very defined layers of clay, compost, and sand. And just the activity of worms and working the beds, it's turned into to something that's a lot more homogenous. You can still see some of the, some of the red clay. But uh, it's really nice soil, you know, even just compared to right here. You can see a difference. Yeah, you can see a difference. And we don't till these beds. Uh, the management is all um, hand weeding, so we, uh, if we're really on it, when there's more students out here, there's no weeds because every day we, we pull a little bit. Um, and when we flip the bed to a new crop, we rake the mulch off and do a very gentle, shallow um, slicing. I actually have the tool over here if you want to see how we do that. How are you adding fertility back to the bed? So every time we flip the bed, which is um, maybe twice a year, um, in goes inputs like compost right on top of the soil and gets raked in just in the top inch very gently um, but we let gravity take that stuff down to the roots and the water will do that too uh, so yeah we do bring in compost now and I might do five five gallon buckets of compost over the bed and then you can also supplement through um, liquid fertilizers or top dressing with chicken manure or whatever through the season if you feel like you need to. But there's such a reservoir of nutrition build up here that um, the, the fertility is really kind of at a point where even without doing heavy amending each season, things will still do well. The amending just kind of keeps it topped off because it will decline. If you're just removing, removing, removing and not putting back in, you'll see a decline in health of the plants. So the, the maintenance of these beds is pretty low uh, tech. The main things we use are a weed whacker to clean up the pathways, um, which you totally could do by hand if you were determined to. And uh, this is a scuffle hoe, and this enables us to do uh, low tillage style weeding like this, where you skim. And uh, we don't use this when there's crops in normally, but when the bed's bare and we're prepping, you just skim like this, and uh, it, it just cuts cuts under the weeds. Certain weeds, I'll, I'll use this and pry it up. Like nut sedge is a really problematic one that I try to remove that way. Um, and then after the bed has been 
weeded really thoroughly, rake it smooth, amendments go on, rake in the amendments just very gently. And then this is another really useful tool. Um, this is called a hori hori. It's a Japanese gardening knife. This side is like a knife blade and this side is serrated. And you can do really um, strategic weeding without damaging your, your crops because the serrated part, um, especially in these clumping grasses, the serrated part right here, you can just cut right underneath of the crown and then the grass comes out. Now, watch what happens if I try to do that without the knife. It, on a bigger one, it pulls out a big clump of uh, soil and disturbs the roots of the adjacent plant. So, I, you know, you can really go pretty quickly with this thing. It's really a, a nice tool. And it also is, I use this a lot for transplanting. You can just open up your holes for transplanting and it's got a, a inches marked out on here so you can me measure depth if you need to. Nice. So there's three principles that we uh, kind of are our guiding principles we teach the students when, when they're working out here. And this can apply to all forms of agriculture, but in these raised beds specifically, it's diversify, intensify, integrate. So diversify means growing lots of different things. That way, um, if you lose one kind of crop, you have other things to sell or eat. So that makes sense. Um, intensify means putting things in as closely and densely as possible because if we're watering and fertilizing and using compost in this valuable bed space on growing empty space or weeds that's not a good use of our time or energy so intensive tight spacings that are just close enough to outcompete weeds but also far enough away to give high yields and uh, integrate so that's trying to use um, the bed in a way that's really so like right here we're integrating lettuce with broccoli in this case the sun comes from the south and uh, this lettuce is actually benefiting from being in a little bit of shade from this bigger broccoli plant right here. And we can also slam in the lettuce on the edge. By the time the broccoli canopy is filling out, we could have already clipped the, the lettuce out. So rather than just letting that space sit empty, squeezing in lots of different things in little pockets, we'll do cilantro on the edges, radishes, turnips, quick turnaround things with slower growing things in the middle. Another example here would be these beans. Uh, we've grown beans in the middle, and then on the sides, Swiss chard, Thai basil, you know, we have lettuce and all kinds of different things on the sides. So I think those three things, if you combine those and you let those three principles kind of guide your production, diversify, intensify, integrate. You can really squeeze a lot out of a small amount of space. Whoa, so I knew Josh was going to drop all kinds of amazing information and knowledge here. Um, lots of pro tips out of this one. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I definitely think this raised bed technique is working really awesome for them. Every time I'm here, it seems like they're producing more. The beds look better. They look healthier. Um, really cool with the Hori Hori knife there too. I'll be sure to, uh, that's a tool we use also. I'll put a link in the description down below if you guys want to check one of those out. Also, you know, Josh is working on a book. Josh has started a, uh, a blog, so I'll put links for Hart, his blog, um, and eventually his book into the description here below. Don't forget, if you guys want to support the show, we've got a Patreon. Even just by buying off of our Amazon link, you're helping to support this a little bit. Doesn't matter if it's a dollar a month, every little bit helps. If you can't afford to put in that dollar, just share the video. We appreciate everything. So I hope you guys like this. Hit that like button. If you haven't subscribed yet, please go ahead and do so. You guys know how we do. Most importantly, pound dirt. Kuchik.